Welcome to Stories from the NNI. My name is Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office, or NNCO. In this story, I had an opportunity to talk to Miguel Galvez of NBD Nano. Miguel is responsible for exploring advanced innovations, new market segments, and strategic partnerships. Prior to founding NBD Nano, Miguel worked as an associate at TechStarts, an early stage seed fund in Startup Accelerator. Miguel, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. It's really exciting to be here. So as you mentioned, my name is Miguel Galvez. I'm the CEO of a company called NBD Nano, which is a specialty materials company. We make coatings and additives that modify the way that liquids interact with surfaces in interesting ways. We've been around for almost seven years, and we're excited to be on the show to talk about what we're doing. So you mentioned that your your company works in in specialty chemicals. I understand that some of your inspiration has come from an insect. So believe it or not, NBD Nano actually stands for Namib Beetle Design Nanotechnologies. And uh, as you mentioned, you know the inspiration for the company, and, and it's really our namesake, is based on the Namib Desert Beetle, which is a you know a beetle that lives in Africa that's able to harvest water on its back by you know using interesting you know surface wettability properties. And so really, what that means is it's able to to manage the way that fluids interact on its back to capture uh, water to drink. You know what we do. Uh, is very different uh, chemically and, and realistically, but in, in, a, in a very similar sense, you know, we also are able to make very unique surfaces that create very interesting properties by creating and managing the way that fluids interact in surfaces by using pattern surfaces or surfaces that incorporate different levels of wettability. And, and really what that means is live different ways that certain fluids, whether it's water or oils, interact with a, with a film. I looked at your website and in the images you share and they're are really fascinating they really help describe what you just mentioned with respect to the the interaction of your surfaces with fluids the concept of of hydrophilic and, and hydrophobic coatings have been a, around for a while can you talk a little bit about how your approach might be different yeah absolutely so you, you hit the nail on the head there's a bunch of coatings companies out there they you know, they claim that make materials hydrophobic or hydrophilic, and some actually do a pretty good job. When we were starting the company, we thought there was an opportunity to create disparate surfaces. So surfaces where you had two different properties. So instead of it being both hydrophobic and, and, hydro, uh, and oleophobic, you could make something that was, say, you know, hydrophilic and hydrophobic on the same film. And that was a really novel concept at the time. And even today, you know, if you look at the genesis of what that's resulted, is in products that have very unique surface properties. So to give you an example, one of our products is uh, what we call a Visiprint, which is really an anti-fingerprint film, but it's very different from anti-fingerprint coatings that you might have on your iPhone or on your Galaxy today, because all those are coated, right, with a hydrophobic and oleophobic coating. What we've actually done is created a surface that has two different properties. It's actually hydrophobic, but now instead of being oleophobic, it's actually oleophilic. Uh, and so you created this really weird you know, dichotomy of, of the way the fluid of your fingerprint will interact with the surface. And it actually results in a material that is much, much better at hiding fingerprint visibility while also having really good cleanability. So again, that's just one example of things that we've looked at to create very unique surface properties that end up resulting in much better products. You you talk about the application for fingerprints for uh, consumer electronics, are, are there other applications for, for this type of coding? So most of the, the anti-fingerprint stuff is, is primarily in consumer electronics, but we do see a little bit of application activity in things like appliances and things like faucets, really, you know, areas where you, you'd be touching a surface, you know, extensively. You could even think of something, you know, like the indoor of a, you have a conference room where you could get a lot of fingerprints. But I'd say, you know, for the most part, it's, it's really defined in consumer electronics. I understand that um, prior to starting your NBD Nano, now that we know where the name comes from, sure. I, I understand that you worked at a, a tech accelerator. Can you provide a, a little bit of background uh, or, or advice to, to students or others who might be thinking about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I was very fortunate. I went, to, I went to college here in Boston. I went to Boston College, and uh, my senior year of college, I had the opportunity to, to basically work at Techstars. Uh, which is a seed stage accelerator for technology companies. And, and really what that means is, you know, they, they invest in companies and then they provide mentorship and office space. And I was lucky enough to, to get an, in a position there, an unpaid internship, if you will, and really just, you know, see what was, you know, what was happening, you know, learn from entrepreneurs, you know, see what they're working on, 
um, understand you know the issues and the challenges. And more importantly, I, I think the the biggest takeaway for me was that these people who start you know big and successful companies, they're no smarter, they're no you know more successful than you are. They just had this idea and they went with it. And I think if if you can kind of take away that you know anyone anything is possible if you put your mind and your and your and your resources to it, it, that's a really empowering experience. And so for students particularly, it's really about kind of getting that exposure early. Talking to people that are, you know, doing on if, if this is what you're interested, of course, doing entrepreneurship or learning about an area of technology or an area of industry that you're interested in, and, and just try to learn, even if it's unpaid. Um, I think it can pay a lot of dividends uh, in the future. Well, that's great, and you you mentioned, you know, the the kind of environment or that's available in Boston, and it's certainly known as one of the great innovation ecosystems that we have in the U.S. Do you share resources with other companies with respect to um, instrumentation? Do you have mentors in the area? I mean, has that ecosystem really enabled you to advance more quickly than perhaps you could in other areas? Absolutely, 100%. So when we started, we actually went through a number of different incubators. One of them, I'll give a shout out, is Greentown Labs, which you may have heard of. They're based in Somerville. They're the largest clean tech incubator. And you know now they've grown to 100 companies. But when we were in there six years ago, you know, there was maybe 30 or 40 companies, but that's a great example of an area where we were able to get shared office space, you know, access to entrepreneurs that were working in similar areas or going through the same struggles that you were. But then even beyond that, you know, after we moved out of Greentown, we ended up getting office space at Boston University. They have a they have a small office area for startups and we were able to use some of their instrumentation in their labs. And actually, even today, you know, we ha- we have our own you know, facility. We have, you know, we're 16 folks now, but because we're in the area, we were able to get affiliation with Harvard University to get, you know, more of the intense, you know, analyticals, uh, you know, the big equipments like the high-tech NMRs or XPSs or, you know, some of the stuff that we just couldn't afford to buy on our own. We've been definitely leveraging that and, uh, you know, having that ecosystem, particularly in Boston, as you mentioned, which is so abundant in a lot of these, you know, deep tech and, and life science ventures, has really been super helpful for us. Just even as simple things as getting access to an NMR machine, you know, which can be prohibitive just because they're so expensive. With respect to, to manufacturing, is is that something you also do there in Boston or, or do you do that in a different region? So we outsource that. Yeah, we, we have a couple of places in the South, once in Tennessee, once in South Carolina, uh, where we work with partner contract manufacturers. And in fact, my, my COO is, is currently there right now, you know, making a metric ton for a customer. So for us, that model has worked really well is to outsource manufacturing. You know, we own the development, we own the customer relationship, we own formulation expertise, but we don't want to be in the business of, you know, owning reactors and, you know, hiring 24-7 workforce. It's just not our business. So, uh, you know, we've been able to find really good partners in that area domestically in the U.S. That, that can do a really good job and allow us to do what we're really good at, which is inventing, you know, inventing products that our customers love. I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to see outputs from our our workshop or some of our webinars where we look at the commercialization of nanotechnology as a pathway, or we we call the the framework kind of the technology development pathway that companies take to take an innovation into the marketplace. And we know that, you know, in addition to the business side, there's a lot of ups and downs, but that's also true for for the technical side, that there are challenges in scale up or in perhaps in quality control. Can you share any insight of, you know, a time when you were challenged along that path and and maybe lessons that, that you learned that could have helped you at the time? Yeah, absolutely. We're going through this right now, so I can give you a very immediate answer. So one of the things that, you know, the materials is, is a hard area to play. It's very exciting. There's a ton of opportunity. There's a ton of new innovations. But there, there's, there's, a, there's a multifaceted, you know, complexity in, in commercializing technology. You know, for one, and this is going to be a pretty long-winded answer, so stop me if it, if it gets a little too much. But, you know, for, for one, you know, you're, you're creating a small component that goes into a large value stream. You know, you can make one metric ton of material that goes into 100 metric tons of product and you are a very small portion of that. And so, you know, that that creates a lot of opportunity to get into very big markets. But it also means that your technology has to fit in price wise and more importantly, production wise. You can't change, you know, production of billion dollars of, of product because you create some unique property in many cases. So you have to fit in within that. The second, which is and I laugh about this because 
you know, it's one thing that I didn't realize when we started the business is, and, and my experience and, and the experience of some colleagues and, and similar you know, materials businesses is, you know, there's really two stages of commercialization. The first is, you know, R&D and customer development. So you have to develop a technology that a customer wants and you have to understand that there's product market fit. And that can take a while. In an NBD scenario, that took you know, almost four years, right? Constantly talking to a bunch of different customers, trying to understand their needs and making sure that we could actually deliver a technology that they'd be willing to pay for and, and would be a good business. And then, you know, one day you're kind of going through the same process and then someone actually finally says, we want to buy this. Can you give us a metric ton by next month? And then you go back and you realize, well, you've never made this past 10 grams. You've never registered it. You've never shipped it you know, globally. You have no distribution. You have no logistical support. Um, and you very quickly, you have to build in this capability to do you know, large scale global manufacturing and distribution. And for us, uh, you know, that was really the, the last year and a half has been kind of on that tail end where we, you know, we got our first few orders, we've been able to scale and make manufactured goods at large production, you know, capabilities and size. And then there's a third part, which we're kind of at the tail end now, which is, you know, you deliver the product, it does what you're supposed to, but now it has to fit into their production scheme and it has to have good QC and QA. Well, I think that that's a that's a great story, and I understand the challenges, but but also I I, I congratulate you on needing to face those challenges because you're scaling up at a at a rapid pace. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your interactions with the NNI or the the federal government? Sure, absolutely. So uh, we have been quite fortunate uh, to get quite a bit of support from the federal government. We ended up winning two phase two SBIR grants. One was from the USDA and one was from the NSF. And this was at a stage in the company where, you know, we were still very early on. This might have been four, four or five years ago when we first won the grants. And we really needed you know, non-dilutive capital to develop the technologies that, that we've now, you know, are commercialized. And a lot of time investors don't want to take that risk because there's so much uncertainty you know, whether there's, there's market requirements, the product market fit, and technical technical challenges to, to be able to deliver on those. And so for us, you know, we were really lucky that the government, you know, stepped up and we were able to get a couple phase two grants, um, which really gave us the runway we needed to get to our next stage of value creation so that we could raise a, our first investment round. And I really do believe that, you know, had we not won those grants, we wouldn't be around today because we just wouldn't have had the runway to prove out enough value to raise capital to continue growing the business. Well, that's great. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that was, it came at a helpful time for you. That's certainly what these programs are intended to do. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. I'm wondering, are there any other closing thoughts that, that you'd like to share with the listeners? Sure. Yeah. So again, the one thing I, I just want to you know take home and, and, and bring away with the listeners is just the abundant opportunities that exist for nanotechnology. I think we're at this you know really cool inflection point where you know you're starting to see mainstream you know adoption uh, of nanotechnology. For a long time, it was you know kind of a pipe dream where you had a material, but no one was really able to commercialize it in a capital efficient way. And and I think we're at this point where you're starting to see large scale adoption in certain industries. And what that's showing and indicating, that's going to continue to occur, um, and it's going to just penetrate more and more industries. And, and we see it every day. I mean, we'll talk to, you know, Fortune 500 companies that have specific teams that are designed to, to look for new materials and solve problems that exist in their business. Um, and so I would just encourage everyone, you know, who has an interest in, in entrepreneurship and in materials to really explore that and see, you know, if they can do something because there, there's just so much opportunities. And certainly there are challenges, and we talked about a few of them. But there's just so much out there that needs to be developed and needs to be commercialized and invented. And I think it's, it's really right now we're entering this really cool new phase of nanotechnology development uh, and commercialization. Thank you for joining us today for this story from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit www.nano.gov or email us at info at And of course, check back here for more stories.